everyone to um, the 336th meeting of the New York Comics and Picture Story Symposium. And um, I thank you all so much for coming to, um, to this meeting of it. This is the first um, um, meeting of our, um, our fall 2022 um, schedule. And um, the symposium has been around, I, normally uh, in, in, in future, um, in future um, meetings of this throughout this semester, we'll just launch right into the speaker. But as this is the first one, I'm just gonna say a little bit upfront to everyone maybe attending this for the first time about the symposium and its history. The symposium has now been around um, for, and I'm just admitting people here as I talk to you guys. Um, the symposium uh, has been around now for a little over a decade. Um, it was founded in the wake of Occupy Wall Street by Ben Catcher, who's a, a cartoonist and educator um, in New York. And it was kind of founded around um, the ideals of uh, Occupy Wall Street, egalitarian ideas about, um, not just about um, um, uh, people being able to speak on any subject they want, artists being able to speak directly to the public, but also ideals of, um, education being free and open to viewers of any background without any barrier of pay. And the symposium now um, over its, um, over the decade um, uh, that it's been in existence. And as we said, this is the 336 meeting. Um, the symposium I think has really valiantly stuck to, um, stuck to these ideals. Um, and the kind of work that the symposium exists in comics to present is work that is often um, self-directed work that maybe isn't generated from a pitch to a publisher or, or, or some kind of um, uh, some kind of situation like that. Work that is against the grain and work that is often self-published or international and, and doesn't have much context maybe in North America. Work that is transgressive and experimental in some kinds of ways. And Ben Catcher has um, curated this um, uh, this program since its inception. Um, he is taking a uh, sabbatical uh, this semester. And uh, my name is Austin English. I'm also a cartoonist and educator. And um, I've assembled um, this, season's, um, this season's slate of presenters. And in a moment in the chat, I'm gonna put a link um, to our calendar so you can see um, the, the next 14 weeks of, of speakers that we'll have um, scheduled for this. And the way that you registered for this talk is the way that you'll be able to register for those talks if you're interested in any of these presenters, many of them international, um, many of them people that um, um, are what well, you won't have uh, such an easy chance to see in, in other contexts. Um, in assembling this slate of 15 people, I wanted to stick with the, the nature of, of what the symposium stands for, people who make work that is transgressive and against the grain and self-directed. I also really wanted to assemble a group of 15 people who, um, who um, make work that, make work that has relevance beyond the insular world of comics and maybe just beyond the world of making art. I wanted to assemble a group of 15 people um, whose work has, has some has something has some um, um, has a real relevance in the day to day world and has has an impact uh, beyond making the work in the studio has has um, it, it has a it has a life beyond what happens within within the artist studio and, and within the world of art that it has consequences um, within the world itself and I think we're so lucky to begin um, this season with Aiden Koch who will. Um, be talking about um, environmental themed comics. Um, and Aiden's work I've known since 2008. Um, and I really uh, have always valued her work in the sense that it's, um, has, it, it has a, a very non-traditional way that it's being, that, that it's made and presented, but it has always really resonated with people in a very immediate communicative way. And I think uh, Aiden's work really embodies this ideal that I have for comics that they can be made um, they can embody the potential of how comics can be made, um, and by doing so, they don't they don't cloister themselves off into some kind of incomprehensible um, uh, underground of expression. They can be vital, uh, immediate expression. So I am just going to get out of the way now. I'm going to read a really quick um, bio of Aiden, and uh, then we will turn things over to her. Uh, so give me one moment. So. 
Aiden Koch is an artist uh, living and working in the Mojave Desert of Southern California. Her work crosses into installation, animation, and sculpture, uh, but keeps a foundation in comics and graphic storytelling. She has released several graphic novels, including the Zurich award-winning The Blonde Woman, After Nothing Comes from Koyama Press, and the recently released Stone Blue, Stone Blue Sky. Um, Koch has a BFA in illustration from PNCA and an NFA in interdisciplinary art from Emily Carr University of Art and Design. Now, before I turn things over to Aiden, I just wanna say, if you wanna participate in the discussion, if you want to ask Aiden a question, um, I really encourage you to, um, as Aiden's talking, you can write a question in the chat. I think we will have more than enough time um, after Aiden's presentation is over to get to anyone who doesn't write a question in the chat, but a way to really ensure that you'll be able to, um, to, to get your comment heard uh, after we finish is to, is to, is to put, the, um, put the comment in the chat, which you can just see at the bottom of your screen. So without um, much further ado, let's give Aiden Koch a hand. And, uh, but you're only gonna hear me <laughs> clapping because you guys are all muted. Um, um, but anyway, here's Aiden and take it away, Aiden. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much, Austin. And you know, a distant thank you to Ben Catcher. I think I did this symposium maybe in 2015 last. Um, so it's such an honor to be here again. And um, let's see, let me adjust some things. Let me see me. Um, yeah, it's really meaningful to be here and to have so many people attend right now. So yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, and I'll also start with, you know, uh, acknowledgement of where I am today, which is coming to you from Landers, California, which as Austin says, in the Mojave Desert. So I'm about uh, two and a half hours away from Los Angeles. And this is the, um, the historic uh, traditional lands of the Serrano people. So I will start with just kind of, you know, telling you kind of the shape of my talk today. Uh, I have tons of images, but yeah, to kind of just like let you know, so you can kind of see the rhythm of it, but just a little bit of history of my work, um, kind of some place-based collaborations that I've participated in and talking through a uh, longer work, just kind of how I think and work and make pieces, um, environmental comics as a genre, and also kind of uh, as a pedagogy. So that's kind of the shape of what I wanna share with you. And I will start by sharing my screen and going to full screen. Cool. Um, so Austin, can you see that? Can everyone see it? Okay. See myself. Um, yes, I can. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Hey, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I've been making comics now, yeah, basically since, you know, Austin and I first met, which is around 2008, 2007 from undergrad, where I studied illustration and basically stumbled on comics as this way to kind of expand on the single image. Um, I found in studying illustration, it was all about storytelling, but it was kind of like, how can you put a story in a one, one image? Um, or kind of these supplementary pieces. And I had a bunch of classmates who were very like already into comics and had a comics collective. And just through their influence, kind of started seeing how this space of comics could be super um, powerful in how and like unfolding stories further than the single image and how to kind of use that space to draw out various nuances or emotions or like, just thinking through things at a slower pace, um, which I just had this really like natural response to. And here's kind of a snapshot of a lot of the zines and books I've put out over these last like, you know, 12, 15 years. Um, and this isn't everything, but this is definitely like a lot of the publications and not everything is comics. Some things have been more like uh, drawing specific projects. Um, there's things that are kind of mixed media with writing and yeah, I think that this, this format though, the, like specifically like the book format was just something that I, I loved. And I think because of that, that pace of storytelling, um, that as you move through the work, you're always, you're kind of building on these relationships, um, the relationship with your audience, the relationship maybe between characters, 
uh, the relationship between language and image. And yeah, there's always something about that that I, I just thought was really compelling um, and could see all these different ways to, to express and to tell stories. So I've been very much addicted to making books ever since and kind of any excuse to do it, I'll do it and like to play with different, uh, different formatting and different kind of layouts. Um, so yeah, when I, for this particular talk and talking about environmental comics, I'll kind of start with like how this became a larger idea um, or like for me kind of coming together of practices. Um, this is a story, or these are some, some images that became the story daughter that I released in 2017 with Kush. And uh, it, it was just kind of this moment. I mean, I think anyone, you know, in the US, uh, 2016 was obviously a very intense year with Trump being elected and kind of the, the reversal of a lot of safety nets and, um, you know, and social safety nets and environmental ones. And I had always been someone who was very interested and, uh, and like involved in various kind of ecological and environmental um, practices. And, you know, and that was kind of starting from a youth growing up in the Northwest and just having this integration of nature at all times. And um, I kind of gave up some of that when I started art school and didn't really see it these a good way to kind of piece these things back together and a couple of projects one that i'll share was one that um showed me that there maybe there are more pathways to including the kind of drawing and illustration and comic work with this than i had kind of realized um but it took a lot of exploring and kind of like a lot of just feeling like anguished and tortured about um being an artist when there's like these huge kind of pressing problems uh, that, you know, are just exponentially getting worse and worse. And for me, I've always been really sensitive, especially to animals and um, thinking about how, you know, how I can be an artist and also like really work towards, you know, involving myself with these uh, kind of ethical concerns. And yeah, this was kind of a time where I was starting to really think deeper about how that can be expressed through my work um, on top of making other types of life changes. And so this particular story, I was kind of thinking about uh, sci-fi as a genre. And um, yeah, this is just one that was uh, this character who is in, we don't really know all the context is, is pretty typical of my stories, but they're like a young person who's like doing all these drawings. Um, and they're kind of just from their imagination and it's all kind of like plant and animal related, but um, you kind of get, you learn later that they've never seen a plant or animal, that they, they left earth in kind of a bad state. And um, despite not knowing that sensation, kind of like have this intrinsic connection um, or curiosity and are trying to understand what that means to not have that present in their life. Um, and so, yeah, that was kind of this like first dabbling of like thinking about what, what are some ways to kind of think about these concepts, um, maybe without doing super explicitly nonfiction work. Um, Cause I always love, I love literature. I love storytelling. I love getting to like think in these expansive, weirder ways. So this was something that was an attempt at uh, thinking through that and something that I had wanted to evolve into a longer piece. Um, where, yeah, it, it, I, I wrote about an essay, which, uh, yeah, I won't, I won't share it all right here, but I thought of it as this like massive kind of like three part trilogy, um, where there's like this angry AI and there's like data or like, um, collection samples of different species available still, but, you know, it ended up just staying at this like 24 or 28 page story, um, but still, it was like a jumping off point for me in thinking about how my stories can move that way. Because um, I think before this, I mean, I, I there's definitely times when I see the connection being there of just like something that I've been interested in. Um, appearances of animals, kind of these like slow studies of landscapes um, and those influences. But I think my stories, you know, before that were maybe more emotional and kind of socially oriented, uh, a little more like human-based stories, but 
I think through that too, I also started thinking about how, you know, this amorphous emotional space that's something I've really uh, kind of utilized or experimented with was something that would actually transfer really well to these really kind of heavy ecological topics. Um, Cause although, you know, there's, there are some straightforward solutions to our global crises, but there also aren't, I mean, every, it's very like, everything's so complicated at this stage that I feel like it helps me to kind of like think through things in a more nuanced manner, kind of balance the like, mm, the space that's like a little harder to sit with. Um, so yeah, this is another story more recent, also published um, through Kush. And it's about a character who um, is just describing this former life of theirs as a fish and just what that experience was like. And they're kind of in this therapy session. So they're, yeah, they're, they're trying to explain what it was like, but also finding that they don't have words for it. Um, and so, yeah, it's something like that where I was like, oh, comics is, this is like the space for that because you don't have to describe things just with words. Um, and so I really tried to use the, the mediums themselves to like actually give the reader this like larger sense of their experience. Um, so playing with the pastels and even using this kind of like vintage, uh, uh, vintage collage that was a big nature book I had and I found all the kind of fish pages and started cutting out pieces and um, the kind of negative space was actually space that describes the outline of a fish so this is the the spaces of water around it um, and thinking of that is like also developing this connection uh, directly to you know that habitat um, and then also the kind of more visceral emotional connection uh, which is something that yes yeah, you know indescribable but there's these ways of maybe thinking through what that feels like um, and that maybe isn't all yeah like describable with words um, so yeah this this is another more recent book that came out in 2020 and I'm working on a translation right now because the um, publishers I worked with were actually in Spain. And so the only printed version I have is in Spanish, but um, yeah, this, this is a longer story too, that it is definitely more driven through the characters, uh, the characters kind of social relationships. Um, and it, there is a heavy presence of, it's kind of a story about friendship um, and making kind of big changes in one's life and taking these risks. Uh, but also there's, this book is um, kind of balanced out by this narrative of a river. And at times it's like the river story is, is, has a metaphorical sense to it, but I also wanted it to kind of be its own story and the river to be an actual character. Um, so between every chapter following these characters, there are these pages that are just talking about the convergence of these rivers and their kind of journey to the ocean. Um, and it's just kind of a description of what that is and, and talking about the river as, and the, the water as a character. And yeah, one of the ways I, I tried to play with that too a little bit was by doing only wet on wet for these pages. So there's a little bit of this loss of control and also um, surprises by actually letting the water lead the pigment a little bit. And th that was just something that I think for this story felt really helpful in, in giving a little bit of that agency over to the medium um, and over to the story. So yeah, that playing with that was something that I was really curious about and also expanded my thinking on, um, yeah, just how the medium can enhance this element uh, and kind of be more like, you know, almost a collaboration in sense. So yeah, this is, you know, I'm just kind of doing an overview of more recent works and just where I've been thinking and coming from. Um, yeah, and this is kind of another piece for Lab Magazine uh, that I, it's about the idea of the commons or historic commons and something where I, I tried to do a little like actual mini essay at the bottom um, for anyone who maybe doesn't know some of that history. And it was relatively new to me. Um, so something that I want to share, but also not some not a text that I wanted to 
integrate into the image. I wanted the 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 actual uh, event and kind of the the characters' emotions, which um, here they're kind of all talking about the different relationships they have to this land that's now cut off from them, um, and then to give the context through the essay itself. So thinking through the image text relationship in a, a couple different ways, um, and also something where I like I integrated some of the sources. So yeah, these are kind of all these ways that I've been thinking through this. Um, and just as like another point of context, I mean, I comics is definitely the main area that I've been working for this time, but I also do a, a various amount of mediums and um, uh, exhibiting work, um, doing animations. Um, yeah, just kind of like trying to play in all these different ways. And I feel like, cause this will kind of come into play later when I talk about thinking about larger version or um, expanding this idea of environmental comics. Um, I mean, for me, everything does kind of come back to comics. So like, even when I think about making work for spaces, like this was from a, a show in Los Angeles a couple of years ago. Um, I always end up thinking about the relationship of everything in the space um, and this idea of relationality. So yeah, in making a show, it's always what is kind of the larger story that's happening. Um, and that, I don't know, something about that, again, just really like is how I kind of think through making work. Um, so none of these pieces kind of existed as their own. It was like the idea is that they all have this like dialogue going on. Um, and so, yeah, those are all kind of similar, similar topics and like relationality is this like kind of key, um, key way of developing work. So uh, another project that I started, this was also 2017. So as I was working on this piece, this like shorter comic daughter, the other side of what I started doing was like, um, trying to think, yeah, in how many other ways can I be integrating, uh, ecologic conversations and um, work with animals or, you know, how, how can the creative process and this other, other kind of area come together? And I mean, I know artists that it seems like they just do this seamlessly where they integrate all their interests and like all their politics and like, um, you know, uh, kind of, yeah, interest in one thing. And that's something I, I don't know why it's, it's always felt more of a struggle of like, trying to find it in a way that feels really seamless. So this was another project that I started um, called the Institute for Interspecies Art and Relations. And it's actually something I'm hosting a couple of events this coming week in Los Angeles, if anyone's there at Heavy Manners Library. And the idea of this project was like, um, especially as a self-publisher going to book fairs, I was always finding that although many tables would have kind of ecological content or, you know, I'd, I'd find things that kind of melded these worlds. There was never one single publisher that kind of represented this intersection. Um, there's not like an eco press at the art book fair, or at least there wasn't historically when I was going. And similar with kind of galleries and museums, I would see this coming up often as like just one more thing to cover. Be like, oh yeah, and then you know, in December we're having this show that's all like work about global warming, but then we're moving on. Um, and there wasn't like a real concentrated space or programming or kind of, um, yeah, area that, that felt like it was representing this. And, you know, I've tried my best. I'm not saying I am the person representing this, but um, I think it was just something that motivated me into seeing what could happen by starting this project. Uh, and yeah, so originally the idea was publishing um, and then it kind of expanded into all these other areas and publishing is probably the bottom of the list these days. Um, I've done more kind of event hosting, workshop hosting um, and yeah, kind of working on these different, different projects that are specifically usually collaborations with other artists. So really trying to reach out and find um, other artists who are thinking in the similar way of like, you know, thinking about extinction, thinking about um, you know, kind of like habitat decline or, or all these different things, biodiversity, and just having conversations, um, being a resource, trying to like create events that bring people in and just make, 
I don't know, get people thinking and talking in this way and also, you know, feeling seen, I think. Um, Because I was living in New York when I started this and part of what felt hard sometimes in New York was that even though it is a really unique kind of biodiverse area, especially with the wetlands out towards JFK, um, it's such a human centric city. I mean, obviously that's like, it's part of what makes it so beautiful and fun, but I think it also feels so challenging sometimes when you're looking to connect in this way or feel like you are connected to the, the larger globe um, and kind of environmental movement. So yeah, this was something that it really motivated me and um, was a way to also balance out kind of where I saw my inabilities and in other mediums to kind of work through some of this. Um, so for example, this was one of the events that I held um, with another cartoonist, Lala Albert, um, another artist, Suki Sekula. And we, yeah, we, we all met together at the Marine Park Salt Marsh, which is yeah on the way to JFK and um, worked on drawings together, uh, specifically birds. Lala is a big birder um, and Suki has us kind of more specialty in insects. So hosting things like this that kind of, you know, just try and get people out who are interested. Um, usually I try and keep it, you know, not super grim and sad and try and think about how art can really lift people um, who care about the world because there are, you know, an ecology, because uh, there's so much to be depressed about. And, you know, I think that if there are these ways that start bridging topics and bridging interests, then, um, you know, part of having community around this is like helping to work through what's hard um, and giving people resources and access to ways of kind of dealing with the, the struggle of acknowledging what, you know, what a critical time this is. Um, yeah, and another kind of thing that happened through creating this project, if you are, um, things kind of started popping up too that invited me to do things that were not things that I would necessarily have thought of myself, um, which is always such a special thing of being invited to something is that other people can see your work in different ways. And uh, yeah, the, I got invited to this uh, event called the, um, what was it? The, it was something Anthropocene. <laughs> Which, if yeah, if you're not familiar, Anthropocene is kind of this term that was coined to describe the geologic age we're in and the impact of man towards um, totally reworking the earth. And it's, you know, the term itself is really, people are here and there about it these days. Um, there's a lot that's kind of criticizing it because it, it puts the blame on people as a whole rather than specific, like, um, talking about hierarchies and talking about corporations and kind of, you know, the um, disparities across the world, which, you know, the US and specifically corporations and like, there's, there's different um, patterns to acknowledge, but uh, yeah, I was invited for this kind of large event. And the, um, the thing they were interested in doing maybe was me hosting a uh, a comics drawing workshop. Um, so yeah, we were thinking that it was it was titled Funny Animals, which in comics is kind of this classic term for cartoons that are just like funny animals. Um, and I'm sure it's something we've all come across through various ages and it is like its own little subcategory within comics. Um, and some of, you know, some of funny animals is poignant. Some of it is just like trash. It's just, you know, it's just a, uh, yeah, an interesting area to think about um, and to think about actually in relationship to animals. So, you know, I think when looking at those comics, seeing like, how do they shape our social perception? Um, how do they actually influence how we see animals um, given it is this very specific category? So finding that actually as a space to kind of examine and critique um, and then also to create from of like, okay, so what about if you do really think about animal characters and animal representation, um, how can you use that as something that supports animals? Um, 
So acknowledging, of course, that, you know, you're always coming from a human perspective, but what are some of these kind of ways you could play with that and encourage um, better relationships with animals through using animal characters? So I did a, I hosted a three-day workshop and not everyone do comics, it was open, so it could be poetry or short story. Um, but yeah, so it was kind of one of those moments that really stimulated a new way of thinking for me. Um, and how do I, you know, how is this also this connected to this bigger idea? How is it connected to comics history? How is this connected to um, my work as well as the work of others historically? And I, yeah, that was really, exciting and I think for me just generated so much thinking because especially with my um, iffy art project I've just been reading nonstop about um, animals and um, yeah thinking what yeah what where else can that go um, so that intersection was really exciting and this was also um, oh it was Anthropocene campus <laughs> that was what it's called yeah so this was uh, where the event took place and they also had me um, do this installation so um, these are hanging silk banners that are printed on and uh, another kind of example of thinking in this term of environmental comics, um, but also as an installation in space and, you know, what does it mean to kind of walk through this and the relationship of these trees, which are all um, based on trees from the Amazon rainforest. So, yeah, that kind of leads me to this um, place based collaborations and Another area where I started seeing the, the different ways that this idea of environmental comics or thinking in, yeah, this term eco-comics um, can, can be not just its own thing, but also intersect with other types of projects. And this was something I actually um, collaborated on, I think it was like 2013 with um, Lisa Schoenberg, who's an incredible percussionist um, and entomologist. Um, so she studies insects, but also is like an incredible composer and musician. And she invited me on this research and art project in um, three of the Hawaiian islands. And we were looking for the endangered Hylaeus bee, which was a, a bee that she'd studied or um, she'd worked on a endangered species petition for um, through the Xerces Society based in Portland, Oregon but she'd actually never gotten to go to Hawaii to see the bees or to connect with her collaborators on the petition. So <clears throat> after that job was over, she kind of came up with this interdisciplinary project and pitched it and got a little bit of funding to go to Hawaii and follow up on the research she'd been doing through the Xerces Foundation. And I kind of came onto the project as illustrator, um, you know, apprentice, uh, and like driver. Um, so we were in Hawaii for a month, yeah, back in 2013, just um, looking for Hylaeus bees and kind of seeing what was going on, um, talking to local biologists and kind of an environmentalist and just getting a lay of the land on what's, what's going on with this like very, very special small native bee. And uh, I did a lot of just kind of spot illustrations that ended up in the book as well as some watercolor landscapes and then I also did a series of these little comics that are just these moments um, that we had on the trip. And that, yeah, the integration of those felt really meaningful to me. Um, and so, yeah, here's a photo of Lisa's of, this is one of the Hylaeus bees. So they're teeny tiny and they're very special little solitary bees. Um, they mostly live in coral and lava rock <clears throat> on their own. Um, and they are, they're very threatened. And actually, I believe as of like two years ago, they are protected now through um, the Endangered Species Act. So that was like years after we did this project. And, you know, I really feel like Lisa ended up going back and really sharing a lot of the work she did. And, you know, I think that some of that engagement had, you know, had an impact um, or at least like help people see this be in a different way or, or even see that it exists. Because uh, it is so, so incredibly small and does not live in the way that we think of bees as living in terms of, you know, honeybees. Um, and another project that I joined on to for three years uh, is called Project Sue. And my uh, artist and friend, Margaret Tolbert, 
um, she invited me onto this, which is this, I mean, incredible in-depth work uh, that's following kind of the different water systems throughout southwestern Turkey. Um, so kind of the ancient Lycian uh, region of Turkey. And she has had, I, I forget how many collaborators there were, but um, a huge group of collaborators um, over many years and kind of taking these trips with different people and following the water passageways kind of through these different lenses. So some of it was like um, kind of through geologic, um, some of it was through working with cave divers. Uh, yeah, there's all these kind of different, different lenses to the, the history of water here. And part of it is also that it's tied to mythology. Um, and yeah, there, there are so many different kind of empires that were part of this space. So it comes up in these different ways through history. And also, you know, people there just talk about water in this really beautiful way of like um, being proud of like the local water, thinking about it um, as this kind of, you know, something that tastes amazing or something that has these generative qualities. Um, and so there's these kind of stories that even just go back through history now um, about this connection. So, and also something that of course is, you know, currently disrupted through heavy agriculture as well as um, a really kind of, there's a lot of huge infrastructure projects going in that are also kind of draining a lot of these ancient water sources. So yeah, again, I kind of got invited into this project and you know, learned so, so much from it and did tons and tons of kind of these spot illustrations um, in the field, just like working and drawing everywhere we went. And then also um, through talking with Margaret, ended up doing this kind of series of short vignettes that are based in some of the different regions that we visit and the different ruins um, that have a lot of meaning to this larger story. And then putting them in the kind of mythological lens of the goddess Leto, um, who gives birth to uh, Artemis and Apollo. So here's, yeah, just kind of a, a spread from that story. And yeah, again, kind of being, seeing, you know, for me, it's like, I, this is such like a multi like project. It's so, you know, there's so many pieces to it. It's hard for me to think about having come up with something like this on my own, but seeing how it integrated into this, this project was so exciting and cool because there are these kind of larger implications and investigations going on. And I think comics really found a place in it. Um, so. Hopefully I'm not talking too fast. <laughs> um, but you know, I, uh, I put all the images together and then I didn't actually practice speaking. So I'm always like figuring it out as I go. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of like all this like history, these kind of explorations, all these like, and various collaborations, um, all kind of under this umbrella of like trying to figure out how the hell to like be an artist amid like total ecological crisis. Um, and something that I think, you know, I'm, I'm starting to be more settled with the idea that it's not something that can be totally, you know, I, I'm not gonna figure it out, but I think as an investigation, it's something that keeps bringing me into these new spaces in really interesting ways. Um, and yeah, so kind of, this is the, the most recent book and I figured it's fun sometimes to just talk about a project a little more in depth, um, especially, you know, everyone here probably has some interest in comics uh, and comics creation. And yeah, it's just something that I, I mean, that keeps me going in all this is I just love making these stories and books. And yeah, this is another um, book where I was trying to think through some of these ideas and, and consider different ways of integrating uh, different knowledges into a story. So yeah, this is uh, Stone Blue Sky published by Sporin uh, in Belgium. And uh, there aren't any copies in the US yet, but that will come in time. Um, so yeah, this, this story kind of the original idea was like thinking about family memory, kind of ancestral memory of like maybe hearing stories about places that you haven't seen or feeling these connections or, you know, even something like moving as a child and having these memories 
of a place, um, but also understanding that that place is not going to be what you remember probably, um, or what you believe something to be and trying and reconciling that, but also having that be an opening um, just to, yeah, to, to understand what those connections really mean. Um, and what is it about a place that's like, you know, what are, what are those types of memories like, um, and how can they shape your attitudes and interests later in life? Um, you know, someone who's, you know, is really privileged to grow up in this like beautiful forested area and there was foxes, there was deer, there was like water nearby. And, um, you know, I think that is something that totally shaped my outlook on, um, caring about these things was just having these experiences as a young age and and wanting those things to be preserved in some way even though you know when I go back now of course they've changed um so that was kind of the initial start to this story was was thinking about this character returning to this space that they've heard about but they don't really know um but what was that kind of preconcepted conception of it and um what did they also get out of that experience still? Um, and kind of pairing that, that going back for this human character with this conjoining story of a bird um, and it's, it's kind of migration to this new habitat. Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of wanted to think through these ideas and they do, they do have like an actual intersection in the story at one point, but um, they're also kind of acting parallel for most of it. And there's maybe like, it's not necessarily clear kind of the reality of either in some way. Um, there's kind of these surreal elements to it, but yeah, one of the most, you know, things that was fun for me at least was like drawing these animal characters. So kind of taking that experience of thinking through what does it mean to draw animal characters and yeah, and, and actually doing them in a more explicit way. So yeah, part of the story is kind of this like connection of these frogs to this um, kind of heron egret character and the bird having never been there before, but having, you know, just through its, you know, intuition migrated to this pond and the frogs having this familiarity with it. Um, so frogs as being, you know, a species that probably doesn't migrate super far from their you know, their water source, their food source, um, but also always having a relationship to the seasons and other animals and kind of, um, you know, always having these complex um, interconnected relationships. Uh, and so when those things are severed, kind of what does that mean for different species if something's suddenly missing? And also it's <clears throat> kind of a play on it too, thinking of what are some of the different kind of ancient names? So uh, for the, the heron character, I, I did a little research into kind of different, different names um, for herons or for egrets. And one of the things I landed on, which I'll go, we'll get there, I guess, was Bennu. So, um, but yeah, I also want to think about this relationship and kind of uh, just in a playful way too. So there's this kind of reference to Jupiter, which is from this Aesop story about the frogs who all keep asking for a king. And eventually um, Jupiter sends a crane who eats them all. Uh, so classic kind of Aesop humor. And here's a, a woodblock from that story. Um, and then, yeah, so the this character Bennu also comes into it, which is an ancient Egyptian uh, heron god. So, yeah, the, and Ben is believed to be the precursor of the phoenix. So um, this bird that's really connected to rebirth and this regeneration of itself, which in the story, it kind of has that where you don't actually know, you don't know why this bird was gone. You don't know why it's returned. Um, and so I think that kind of, that kind of also just as like, this research outside played into the possibilities of what's happening in this story. And just for kind of my own visual reference, I always collect different images when I'm going into something, thinking about mood, thinking about um, color palette, thinking about kind of what are some of these connections that I can maybe play with a little. Um, so there's a classic Ophelia painting 
and even some of the design stuff we're like pulling from uh yeah this kind of like bio book design um and then another part of the story has to do with that the frogs actually talking about what's happened to their pond so i i didn't actually know about this before but i ended up taking this um ecology class last fall and we went through kind of all these different systems and one of them was eutrophication which i'd heard about in different terms of like um what's it called it's like red tides or something or like there's these or algae blooms like you hear about that of like oh massive algae blooms um but i feel like it's not always described what that process is that's creating those systems and what like um, dead zones are in the water and so this is that process and actually learning about it i ended up incorporating that into part of the story um because a lot of it is these um like nitrogen and phosphate that come from fertilizer run off into the water and they yeah it kind of like just changes what's going on and eventually um you end up with a you know water that's totally devoid of life um through very through like the lack of oxygen. So here's kind of this extra panel that ended up in the story that was just thinking of like, okay, well, like how's the frog describing this happening to the place it lives? Um, this process of eutrophication. So that that was those two panels that were just like a special insert in the story. Um, so yeah that kind of that brings me to let's see sorry i just wanted to check the time <laughs> um yeah environmental comics and so this is kind of where my like larger research has been um which yeah i i just finished my master's at emily carr university and uh almost instead of making work i ended up just like thinking about work um and thinking about this concept and you know more or less trying to merge these these pieces of my life again which yeah i feel like is this perpetual goal of you know comics this like area of production that i love and obsessed with and like always working on and then yeah these kind of larger um kind of ecological aspirations so this idea of like oh yeah what are environmental comics what can that be um what is it? And yeah, I think it was really helpful in kind of looking through some historic relations like the funny animals were like, you know, I think this is a really famous, you know, pogo piece that kind of stuck around for generations. And I think it was from 1970, which was the first year of Earth Day. So, you know, thinking that this was something that was already kind of seeping into awareness and and coming out in these different ways, which you know, even something like this of that, you know, in the swamp, it's like they're not human. So their perspective maybe you, know, you can look on it through these different different lenses um, because of the way it's like represented as a comic. Um, swamp thing through Alan Moore and kind of this like, you know, the idea that he's actually this weird amorphous plant creature, not necessarily a human. Um, And I haven't actually read these, but I've like I've looked at some of the pages. I was intrigued by this uh, comic concrete that apparently it, it maybe didn't start as totally eco and then went like off the deep end. Um, but yeah, kind of seeing these things like this has definitely been here. It's like these topics have been coming up for a long time, and there's just like all these kind of different treatments and approaches, um, and just seeing like oh yeah, like comics is this really unique space for these conversations um historically kind of through these proliferation of non-human characters not just animals but like you know creatures and organisms and like you know things that just get weird um and that that can actually be such like an amazing tool for representing these discussions um and kind of yeah and just like opening up these ideas in a different way than just reading news articles and um, you know nonfiction. Um, also, you know, probably one of my bigger personal just influences from childhood, um, Naushka, and uh, I finally, you know, I actually hadn't read all the manga 
I was just like, I watched the film over and over and over as a child into adulthood and the manga is amazing. So I was like, so happy to go in and see how much even like deeper and more complex this storyline is. And of course, just being like amazed that, you know, Miyazaki is just so, so sensitive and so like delicate with these concepts um, or like, you know, just creating that space where unlike a lot of other comics where there are more explicit good evil divides. Um, yeah, just how nuanced this particular uh, his stories are. Um, yeah, and, I, and that was like exciting to look back through that history, but then also to kind of do this more personal survey or like um, investigation on like what's now, um, yeah, what's work that is existing now um, and how are people, yeah, just like how are different styles playing into it? How are different stories, different perspectives, um, artists from different backgrounds? So Gord Hill is an uh, indigenous artist from uh, the BC area. I think he's uh, Kwawakwak and uh, is also someone who's been an activist for years. Um, so uh, his, his big book is five, what's, what's it called? The 500 Years of Resistance comic book. Um, which looks at different kind of historic points in indigenous revolutions um, against European settlement um, or, you know, contemporary kind of uh, infractions towards indigenous people in then North America. And then also, you know, and leading up to today and things that he specifically has been more involved in. Um, so yeah, they really amazing artists and um, bringing yeah, these stories into the space of comics, uh, which I think is, yeah, so exciting to have. And yeah, I'll just kind of go through these a little more quickly, but you know, someone like Lala and Wet, was it Wet Earth? Um, that book, Mita Mahadu, who I think is here, hello. <laughs> um, working in mixed media and, uh, and combining poetry with these eco and animal topics. Um, Inez, of course, who I think is gonna be speaking here in the next, or in this fall session, um, an alienation. So this like really beautiful, intense sci-fi encounter with um, extinction and technology and just like tackling so much stuff in a story that still has this like, amazing balance of like lightness and darkness. Um, Sue Ko, who, uh, you know, I, if you know her work, it's very graphic and intense and sometimes a little overwhelming, but has been just like this like hardcore um, animal rights activist and um, yeah, anti-oppression activist for forever British artists. Uh, Lauren Redness who's maybe, you know, I don't know if she would describe her work as comics, but the, definitely the text image relationship um, does that. And uh, yeah, her Oak Flat specifically is um, a recent book of hers on the kind of mining operations in the sacred Apache land, um, Oak Flat, uh, looking at like here by Richard McGuire and kind of seeing this, the story where all time is almost a character in itself. Um, and seeing the impact of that time and seeing these different generations in different ways. So yeah, something like a really interesting idea. And I had to throw a far side in here <laughs> just because. Um, yeah, and so, uh, and through kind of doing that survey, you know, I found of course there are uh, researcher, scholar, people who are already looking at these areas. Um, Animal Comics by David Herman is one book that compiles a bunch of different essays that are about animal perspective, animal comics. Another one is, I think, just called Eco Comics. Um, and I, re I read them all and um, definitely they're like really wonderful resources, like really deep critical thinking, um, tying a lot of this work into yeah, these kind of big, bigger ideas and bigger moments of um, critical animal studies, uh, feminism, um, yeah, like just the, the kind of larger topics. Uh, but, you know, something that I really saw from this too is like not a lot of push or, the, you know, not having a creator's perspective. Um, 
and maybe that's just something like coming from being an artist is a lot of times when I read these kind of um, critical works, it's like, there's so much extrapolation, but sometimes I, you know, it's hard for me some, to not have the artist's perspective on how they work and why they work certain ways. Um, and also like these books didn't stretch super far out into what I considered like the alt genre. Um, so like a lot of the artists I just showed, you know, I don't probably wouldn't show up in a lot of these types of essays. Um, so yeah, seeing this kind of lack of representation there also of people who are working more on the experimental fringes of the actual making. Um, so that was just something that I saw that was interesting. And for me too, like thinking about this topic and what are things outside of maybe the explicit discipline of comics that also have a relationship um, and are just like fun to look at and think about um, as things that maybe that I, I see as being connected, maybe just through my mind being so trained by comics, but um, again, maybe not being things that artists would explicitly call that or have any interest in calling that. Um, but, you know, even these things like these kind of classic diagrams you get um, in bio class or environmental resources class or whatever. Um, but it's like, you know, they're, they're framed in this way because this way is actually a really great way to communicate information. Um, so seeing these things almost as comics because it's, it's such a readable form. Um, and here's Soam, who I think is here too. Hi, Soam. Um, yes, Soam's work, which is really phenomenal and um, companion platform, which is a, a design group. So yeah, trying to look at other contemporary work that exists. And for me, just seeing these connections also to this type of formatting and sequence and um, particularly like seeing a sense of relationality through pieces. Um, and to me, I think that's what bring things back to comics is this idea of relationality of like pieces not existing in solitude, pieces not existing like um, of themselves, but always in relation to the work that's around it or the work that's placed around it. Um, and seeing how that also, you know, is something that's so deeply reflected in ecology uh, of seeing, you know, a species not as an individual to be studied in a lab, but to, something to be studied or like looked at as part of an environment um, that cannot be totally severed from these connections around it. So for me, that kind of like really connected this idea that comics and um, environmental studies or ecology actually have this like really beautiful uh, sim synthesis, I guess. Um, yeah, so these are just kind of other types uh, of work that for me, I see in, I see very much in relation to um, the idea of producing comics work too. Uh, and things are definitely like super inspirational. Um, and you know, of course, going as far back as this is um, wall paintings in the Amazon and thinking how, you know, these things, we mainly, we don't know exactly what, you know, the, you know, the, the goal is of depicting these works. Um, but there's obviously these different elements going on. And, you know, it seems like it's, there's like stories to be told through this um, and stories about one's environment. So yeah, this kind of, all this stuff is what led me to um, writing this essay that was published in spring with Bomb Magazine. And yeah, like finding another format to also think through this work. So. It wasn't something that felt explicitly like it should be a comic, but um, yeah, having it be an illustrated essay kind of felt appropriate to the idea, to this like research. Um, and also like kind of starting with myself and working as a cartoonist, like finding, finding what led me to this place. Um, and then, yeah, and that, that kind of opened up even more into this, uh, more conceptual investigation of like, okay, so here's this idea, there's environmental comics, but like, yeah, how do you approach it as a creator? Or like, what are some interesting ways to approach it? Um, and how can it maybe be like a pedagogical tool uh, for interacting and thinking about environment? So this is my like wacky and funny little website that I made uh, that has some of these ideas and links and, 
yeah, just for kind of context, the, um, the categories I was kind of thinking about that would be interesting for making. And, and then I was kind of thinking of this of like, okay, future workshops or something, um, observation. So making comics directly from observation, um, position, thinking of oneself as the starting point, like personal histories, identity kind of histories, um, social history, like how is that a place to think about one's own connection or disconnection to their environment um, perspective. So going back to that, like funny animals of like, what are different tools for maybe thinking through another species um, and how can that be productive or how can that be something um, that leads you to new, a new appreciation maybe of the, the greater living world. Um, collaboration, which super vague, but maybe like, you know, doing drawings that the wind then has an effect on or something you bury in the ground and see what happens. Um, so different ways of producing images and integration. So like the idea of maybe something site specific um, and how does something being in that place relate to the larger environment that it's in. So those were kind of like these things I was thinking about and the website has more if you want to like go around there. Um, yeah, and so it, that's kind of, I made this website last summer and then have been adding this and that to it. And part of what I ended up doing too was it, um, I did end up hosting some workshops and here's actually a, a worksheet that I made that you can download on the website if you want to do it. But yeah, thinking of kind of this is just like, a playful tool um, for people, something to not only just like get jump started with drawing, but something that, yeah, kind of slows you down and like makes you consider the kind of how, why, what of where you are um, and what the different connections around you might be um, and how stopping and kind of drawing or thinking through these processes can build that appreciation and connection. So, yeah, I also in this last year hosted four different workshops that were like total experiments. Um, yeah, coming up with these different types of exercises to be done, uh, mostly in site specific places. Um, one of them was on Zoom and it was, it was definitely different to do it that way, um, but not impossible. And something that was kind of fun because we ended up playing with like Google Maps and different like live cams. Um, and using some of the online tools, but uh, this is a giant rock, which is near my house. And yeah, we ended up doing exercises with like yeah, drawing like the rocks and turning them into characters. Or this is one, I, this is my drawing from this, but um, I made everyone make characters out of tracing trash and rocks from the area. And then we like use those characters in the longer kind of like wacky freeform comic um, that we all collaborate on. So. Yeah, something that like tried to get, uh, yeah, more viscerally connected. Um, these are some drawings from another one of the workshops down at Mission Creek, which is by Desert Hot Springs near me. Um, this is one from uh, Gainesville, Florida, the Paines Prairie Preserve. Um, yeah, and we did one exercise called Exquisite Tree where I had everyone kind of draw and hide like the canopy and the roots and kind of these different parts of the tree and pass it around and made these like weird hybrid trees out of it. So this is kind of like, yeah, a new kind of leg of my thinking through this stuff is also like, you know, I still love making like fictional stories that are like, I'm just in my studio drawing and thinking this way. But I think also seeing this as something that can connect um, and for me also like get me out of my studio uh, and working with people and building community and looking at places with like a different eye. Uh, I think especially with drawing, it's like, I don't know, you just discover so much um, through that kind of like focus and intention than just like taking a hike or taking a walk somewhere. Um, I think especially, yeah, the first one I did, we were all like, wow, like we never just go to like a park or like a, a nature preserve to just sit. You know, most of the time, at least out here, it's like you go you go hiking. Um, so kind of like just changing the relationship in that way, even you know, even you know, the, the drawings weren't that important as just like being there and having that time. Um, but then the drawings were also fun. So yeah, that's 
um, that is kind of the end of where what I wanted to talk about. I'm just leaving this. This is my house. Um, yeah, so I will stop sharing and drink a glass of water and then we'll move maybe to some questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aiden. That was um, that was incredible, and I um, enjoyed it so so much. And I'm really there are a lot of questions, and I'm excited to get to them. Let me um, unmute everyone. Um, okay, yeah. I'm just I, the option I have here is um, ask all to unmute. So I'm just going to ask you guys to unmute yourself, and. Um, we, um, we, with doing this online with the questions, I'm gonna um, encourage us to be able to ask the questions if you feel like it um, out loud rather than me just reading them uh, in the chat. Um, if you feel, if, if you'd prefer that I just read them, that's fine. Um, but I'm just gonna call on you guys and give you the option up front to, um, to, um, to say these out loud. I'll start with um, um, Austin Perez's question. Austin, do you want to? Um, do you want to voice this question? You asked two, so maybe you maybe you'd rather start with the second one. Austin, let's see. Um, okay, prefer not to be voiced if possible. Okay, that's fine. That's no problem. Um, so I'm just going to read Austin's first question. Speaking of agency to the medium, it's been really interesting looking at your website. Um, when did you feel you were able to acknowledge and give back the agency to the environment you collaborate with? Um, I mean, I think that's like, that's a question that I've tackled with other artists. And I mean, it's so hard because it's like everything that I produce as me, it's like, it will have my hand, it will have my influence. It's like, and it's hard to even say that they're, um, you know, it's like, I'm the one who's guiding the process. So I don't know, I think that's always like just a tricky one. It's like, there's, there's these goals of agency, um, but the achievement level, I think is always kind of up in the air. So yeah, I think there's, I don't know, I think it's just like a, a goal to be sensitive um, and to try and think about outcomes and, you know, and try and think through like, how what are like the most ethical approaches one can have to their work um which again it's like i in my mind it's like probably most things i do are somewhat of a failure where i'm like well i'm still like using processed paper and like printing books and like you know it's like it's it feels impossible to really like achieve a level of <laughs> of like correctness that i would maybe uh, strive for but i think just have that as like a goal shapes the work um I think and that's what I've found to be really interesting is like the more despite having like you know these anxieties there is this way that I feel like they're also shaping the work in new and interesting ways that um that aren't just enhancing anxiety but like something I find really interesting um so maybe that is an answer um, I will, I will, um, did you want to follow up on that at all, Austin? You can type in any follow-up questions you have, and I'll, I'll also um, circle back to your, to your second question uh, after we get to some of these other ones. But if anyone has any follow-up questions to Aiden's responses, please put them in the chat. Um, I'm going to, uh, Bibi, do you want to, um, do you want to maybe voice, um, um, uh, voice this out loud, or, or would you rather me read this? Okay, sure, I will read it for BB. Um, has the pandemic and escalating climate crisis affected your relationship with your work? How? Personally, it's been difficult to validate my art practice when feeling this urgency. If you've felt this or eco-anxiety, uh, how have you combated it? Great question, BB. Um, well, I think it has been holding this question with myself always of like, uh, when do I stop being an artist and start like just, you know, being a field biologist or like, do I go back to law school? Do I go and study, you know, biology, whatever. Um, 
I think that's like a personal anxiety I've held dear for a long time. And yeah, I think that this was like working through this idea has been really helpful. And I mean, that's not to say like, I mean, I, I do a lot of volunteering and that's something that actually during the pandemic, I picked back up. I, I used to work at a nature museum and now um, I'm working, uh, I volunteer with field biologists down in the lower desert. And so I think part of it is like, for me also having the balance of like being physically out there and learning and like working with people who to me are like, wow, you're doing like on the ground work that maybe, you know, leads to actual impacts um, and trying to push myself to be more involved in other ways too, especially locally. But yeah, I think it's, it's just always hard. Um, and sometimes like, well, you know, I can't take art out of myself. Uh, I don't think I'm a super well functioning employee at this point I'm like really much I much more effective being an artist um, or my life is structured around that so it's hard to think about actually shifting gears um, but then I also think art is a really amazing tool and I come back to that perpetually too is like seeing the possibilities and seeing where storytelling fits into these conversations seeing where this like ability to um, access an audience and have a voice um, and a presence is like not to be dismissed. Um, yeah, just kind of like, oh, recognizing how much potential comes with that as well. So I think carrying that is something that I find helpful. And again, it's like, I feel like I'm, I'm always striving for more than what I feel like I'm achieving. Um, but then I also find there's like these moments where uh, I have interactions with people who, because of, you know, conversations we had or, or events that I held, it actually like encouraged them to go do their own work um, or to take, I don't know, like a gardening class or like, uh, yeah, I've had it, I've, I've seen ways where these things have actually percolated out um, among my community. And that gives me hope that just like doing this work has relevance and importance. Um, so that's, yeah, I think it's, it's just hard. Um, but there's ways to find, find where art can fit in um, and ways to know just like maybe there are other things outside of it that uh, come along too. Um, I'd actually like to follow up on that just a little bit before getting to the next question. And what, one thing I was wondering and related to what you just said and as you were speaking was how, how much explicitly you are thinking about this current mode of comics you're making as activism or it, just on the spectrum of, you know, most people would um, um, think maybe if a comic was going to comment on environmental issues, they'd expect it to maybe be an infographic of, of some sort or something that was uh, educating people in a very straightforward way and telling them what steps they need to take or telling them the, the background of some issue. And I feel the work that you've been doing, um, there are, there's, there, you were referencing things that, that do that, but so much of the work you're doing seems to be about your thinking about these issues or interacting with these issues and relating to them. Um, you did mention the project you did with an artist that, that led to some kind of conservation. Um, and so that's, and, and it seems now uh, like towards the end of your talk and in this response that you, that you are thinking of it as a form of activism. And I'm kind of just wondering if you could talk about that a little more head on. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's where these, like, there's always this like interplay of my own kind of concerns about just being an artist, um, that in a way that isn't explicitly activist and kind of like, what is that line? Um, and I think with the story work, it's like, I mean, it's partially, it's just, it's, you know, something I really care about doing. Um, but I also think there are ways, it's like, there's, there is the kind of straightforward, like, action now. Um, but I think there's also the kind of, like, larger just movement that I, you know, is something I feel like maybe I'm participating in too, that's just, like, reframing storytelling characters, um, there's kind of like a, a social and cultural component, um, which for me kind of goes right. Like Ursula K. Le Guin wrote this little book, The Carrier Bag Theory, and it's it's all about story. Um, and part of it was just like, uh, 
yeah, how we tell stories like does have impacts culturally. Um, and whether it's the story of like the hero and the villain or it's the story of just like in hers, it's kind of this like Neolithic character who's just like picking grains. Um, and yeah, the, the presence of those stories shapes how we view um, different parts of our, you know, our environment or our society. So there is kind of this, yeah, there, there's this area where I think comics really can fit in to also that kind of cultural wave. Um, and that those stories have importance and existing. But then, yeah, I think for me, I think as much as I can like feel that there's a validity there, um, I also find for myself, it's like, that's not enough for me, just given kind of the extent of the, yeah, of the crisis we're in. Um, so, and I think that's where I was like, seeing where these workshops can maybe start to push. Yeah. Um, and seeing how, yeah, there's this necessity of like community in particular. <clears throat> and for me, that was like, uh, yeah, like the, the physical community here, but then also I was thinking about like the commerce community, like a space that I've been part of for so long. Um, and thinking about how this conversation within that community also can move forward. So I think that part though is like really seeing that, you know, seeing that problem where it's like one person can't change everything. Um, so finding it as a space to connect with people and hoping and believing and pushing for different outcomes through those like modes of connection. Um, that's there too. And then, yeah, for me, just finding like other personal ways. Uh, but I think it's just such an evolution of thinking and working. Right. Along it's, do uh, you see this as a long-term project of what you're, I mean, it, having you said that, it would seem like something that you're thinking of as, as being something that you'll be focused on for a long time um, for, it to, for it to have that organic nature. I think potentially, and like part of that is just where it moves organically. Um, so just like, you know, I, this is something with IFYAR that's always come up. It's like, it's a project that's just run by me and I have no funding. So there's like moments where I'm all in because I'm so excited about it and I just want to do things. And there's moments where I'm like, I actually can't do this because I have to like make a living. Um, and, but it's, it's the response from people that has kept it going. Um, and I think similar to this idea, it's like, okay, I'm going to like throw all this out there and I'm going to talk about this and like, you know, and see if people connect. Um, and if they do, then like keep those connections going and kind of see organically where that can be. Uh, yeah, cause I, you know, I don't, it's not that I see an end, but I'm just like, I don't know where it's gonna go. So it's like starting here and seeing what happens. I'm going to move on to uh, Lindsay's question. Lindsay, would you like to, um, to, to read this one? Yeah, sure. No problem. Uh, first of all, thank you, Aiden. That was a wonderful talk. And thank you, Austin, for organizing this. Um, I feel like, Aiden, you might have touched a little bit on my question. I feel like I might want to change a little, a little bit. But um, I wrote, you spoke towards letting the medium take over in your work, i.e. painting wet on wet. Uh, I've been drawn to the delicacy of your work for a long time. I think I actually first discovered your work on Flickr, like maybe <laughs> like 12 years ago or something like that. Um, right. So I was wondering how much planning goes into your projects and how much of it is intuitive uh, versus how do you balance when to find discipline and relinquishing control in your work. And I think I'm mostly interested in um, your visual language and how you kind of developed your mark making and your style over time and how you've embraced the mistakes and kind of the evolution of that along the way. Yeah, great. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely don't thoroughly plan projects ever. There's like ideas and I think that was kind of showing those uh, references for Stone Blue Sky. It's like, I might kind of compile things and compile certain ideas um, and I like did the first five pages of that and I was like, okay, what happens next? Um, and then, and having these kind of touch points where I was like, I remember writing down like, like a poet frog. Um, 
and I'll just have this kind of assemblage of thoughts and start bringing those together once I start drawing. And I mean, it is hard because it, it is, yeah, mostly just like this weird intuitive process of like writing the text on the page before as I like keep going. And um, I mean, editing for me is usually like redrawing a whole page just because I don't have a great like layout system ahead. Um, and it's just trying to get it right. But I mean, for me, that's always what's exciting um, is like having, just having these ideas to go off of and then um, actually watching visuals come together for the first time. Uh, like not actually knowing necessarily all the things that are gonna happen, not knowing all the interactions or kind of like little, little moments, little connections. Um, but that stuff comes up as I'm drawing. And yeah, in the, um, the translation, I'm, the English translation for um, the spiral that I'm working on right now, I mean, that was interesting because I have actually ended up working with an editor and for the first time, like going through it way more thoroughly after the fact with her um, and changing a lot of the text, even changing elements of the narrative. And I mean, it was really exciting because I think it's gonna make it a better story overall, but so hard because historically I'm just like, winging it so much um and it's yeah it feels like kind of I mean a new new territory but one that I'm really excited about um and so, something I feel like I'll probably even without the help of an editor probably go back in and do more um kind of like tweaking the little things that just kind of end up in there because I'm just like going as is so they're not they maybe aren't as intentional um especially with some of the like kind of text and language but yeah I mean I think my my style is like with really loose medium so there is just a need to be loose with it um and feeling confident enough that I'm like I'll just redraw it if I screw up <laughs> or like we'll just like detour I don't know that's great thank you <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I'm going to go on to Jenna Rosso's uh, question, and they um, want this question to be read. Um, when we think of your comics work and how it expands the medium, uh, we're reminded in a similar way of how JP, and I'm going to butcher this, Snya uh, has expanded environmental documentary film by fluidly observing specific regions and how these areas impact the people living there and vice versa. In the end, Sniadeki's narratives feel as spontaneously constructed and, and uh, organic as yours do. As you approach a project, do you avoid learning too much about a region slash species before experiencing it firsthand to create an organic piece? Cool. Thank, yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, I think that would be, you know, mostly connected to those collaborative projects. Um, I haven't gone too far ahead on my own to like, um, go in depth like that. And those ones are definitely more kind of these like documentary based projects. Um, with, with the project with Lisa, I mean, she told me a lot about what we were getting into and I'd read some kind of histories of Hawaii um, ahead of time. But I mean, so much of that learning was on the ground. Um, and specifically because, you know, as much as Lisa could have told me ahead of time of like, okay, the bees habits are like this and they, you know, hang out around these plants. Um, it was really like being there in the environment and having to like learn the different plants um, and, and learn to recognize them. And, and a lot of that I ended up doing through drawing because um, I, I find I, I learn particularly well from drawing, like, uh, like especially with, yeah, the, um, I don't know, some of the, some of the plants that the Hylaeus would be around yeah, after I would draw, I'd be like, oh yeah, so it's the one that has like the five little white lee or like, you know, petals and then it kind of crawls like that. It's, um, I, yeah, I think that that's just the way that I personally learn. And so it made it so much more exciting too in like a way of connecting with that place is to like learn through drawing. Um, and yeah, similar with the uh, Praje Su, I'd, I'd been to Turkey, but not to this region, so there was so much just from being there. And uh, there's supplementary stuff, especially with histories that I've gotten ahead and afterwards and just you know stories that Margaret would tell me as we drive from different locations. Um, but you know, in terms of representing or, or understanding what's 
what's happening now, uh, that was very much just being there um, and being around people and uh, yeah, going to these like incredible ancient sites and just kind of like thinking about those spaces. So yeah, I mean, I think something that I've always wondered is like, is there a project like that that I would head start? Um, and I'm still not sure. Uh, it's, yeah, cause it's not a mode of working that I feel inherently like compelled towards, but it's one that I'm also really interested in in terms of like being a collaborator on. Um, and with the, um, the spaces I held workshops on, I mean, especially the local ones, um, they're kind of more histories I know from just living in this community. So that's something I think is really nice because there's, um, especially like Giant Rock, kind of everyone who came is someone who lives in the desert. So sharing our own kind of histories of this particular location, what we know about it, kind of myths we've heard. And um, I think as something coming together and sharing was just really, I mean, that was really fun. And then all kind of learning more just through being there drawing. Thank you for that question, uh, Generosa. I'm gonna um, move on to uh, Austin Perez's second question. Um, in terms of preservation and archival work, what are some ways you see your work uh, being archivable? Is it something you have in mind when, co when collaborating with the organic and shifting medium that is nature? Um, no, I'm, I'm not one to think about archiving. <laughs> uh, it's always a good thing to think about, probably, but yeah, it's something I find really difficult. I also, I have a really like disorganized studio in terms of um, knowing where my things are, knowing where they've gone, knowing when I'll get them back. Um, and I think with materials too, I mean, I, I mostly use just traditional drawing materials. Uh, so I assume that they're good to go, but um, it's not something that I, I try and worry about. Well, do you, I mean, are you thinking of these, the, the destination of most of these things being print and, you know, print and com? I mean, you, you said that you've always been interested just in, not just the experience of making comics, but of making books. I oh, believe yeah. That during, during the talk. So those are naturally, you know, they have their own natural archival nature. That's true. Yeah, I mean, that is the joy of producing books is like, um, yeah, it's true. My comic pages just like get shoved in a flat file or get like tossed around the room. But uh, knowing that things exist beyond in book format is really like the thing that I love. Um, I mean, especially that it's like, yeah, it, it moves out around the world. So, I mean, I think thinking of that for, yeah, if there's artists who are, are like comics that are being made using more experimental approaches, it's like, if the goal is reproduction, even if it's online reproduction, then it's like anything goes. Um, I think it's like the ability of that content to move to an audience is just like always what I feel like is so special. Thank you for that question, Austin. I'm going to move on to, um, let's see, Jordan's um, uh, question, Jordan Spencer, and he wants me to read this out loud. Can you talk more about your work in environmental comics in, uh, integration installation? I'm thinking specifically of the wooden comics frames you installed in the, in the desert. How do you think about documentation and the temporary nature of this kind of comic as opposed to paper comics? I guess we touched on this um, a little, um, but I, I believe there's elements that, are, that, that you can expand on. I, I'm gonna also bring in Jordan's other question here. Um, also, assuming you have complicated feelings about land art in general and would be curious to hear how you've been thinking about it. Yeah. Oh, totally. Thanks, Jordan. Yeah, I mean, have you guys all seen that? They just released that aerial footage of Michael Heiser's Nevada project. It's so nuts. Um, worth looking at. I think there's like a Times video and very complicated feeling. Um, yeah, and I think that's like, the idea of those strategies, the like five kind of areas I listed, um, I think to me they're like, they're places to kind of think outward from um, and things that aren't, that, I don't know, I still like create all these divisions in my practice of like, what is something, what isn't something. Um, and in terms of like specifically what I really want to make 
for myself is like often work in the studio, but for things that I want to make in this kind of like larger pedagogical sense, it's like, yeah, I'm really curious about um, engaging with these different ideas. And um, I think it's because that makes it a conversation versus like me just working on a story. It's like, I can bring people in, but most of the time it's just me. But yeah, thinking about these strategies in terms of talking with other people about it. Um, I think that's something that makes it so interesting is like, yeah, that, and then uh, Jordan's referring to this piece that's on the site that's like under that uh, category. And it's just this like funny frame I made that was for a screen. And then I like ended up putting the yard and just kind of like enjoyed the way it divided up the landscape a little bit and just this other way of, um, yeah, framing how one views their surroundings. Uh, and that, so that was just kind of like a super temporary thing in my yard. Um, but I think it is like, I, it's something that I think is, would just be really interesting to engage with more um, and more with other people as like, what, what does it mean? How can it be used um, effectively or in a way to like enhance one's relationship with that space or um, open up some kind of critical dialogue um, I think it's, yeah, thinking about how, how that kind of intention can be part of the work, um, and be really thoughtful versus kind of these, like, like this Michael Heiser project, which just like blasted the landscape and made this incredible, like insane monument, um, to, I don't know, uh, but yeah, so, so I think like all of these ideas, they're, I think they're all ones that are like, and I, and I had this like kind of long debate or conversation about this idea of collaboration and it's like, can you actually collaborate with non-humans? Um, and it became this really like tangled ethical debate and, um, and as much as, yeah, and I, I think that's what's interesting about it is that there maybe isn't this like clear solution to that approach, um, but it's an area to explore um, so I think, yeah, that, if that makes sense, that's kind of how I, I think about these strategies as these like starting points for kind of larger, um, acknowledgements of relationships. Has the collaboration that's happened with these projects, has that been, um, I mean, your, your work prior to this, for the most part, I believe has been mostly done in, in the way that a traditional alternative cartoonist might work, like completely your writing and your drawing and, and you're designing the page. Um, do you feel that this more collaborative mode of working was something that you were naturally coming to already or has it been something that's that's kind of expanded in, in this mode of, in, in this project? And then I'm, I'm also kind of curious as to what, through doing that conversation and through having that interaction and conversations, um, what, what responses you've had that, that are unique to this project for you or, or things you've learned or, or things that have been relevant? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, kind of like I mentioned being asked to do the funny animal thing. I mean, for me, just, I, I can so easily just be in the studio working on my own stories. Um, but then it's like through these invitations, I like see these other like forms for the work and like ways that these these approaches can be integrated into these different stories. Um, and that is so exciting because I feel like, oh my God, I must be so like just stuck in my little uh, cartoonist box studio. Um, and I think that's, I mean, that's just so fun. And I think that it helps me see comics in this bigger way of, of also, of, you know, of connecting to all these other conversations with mediums um, and, and studies and like, uh, it's just exciting when other people see a place for it. Um, so I think that is something that's like expanded my thinking on what's possible in some ways. Um, yeah, I think even like, you know, if Mita's still here, like I saw that uh, she did a comic for, I think it's like uh, King County Department of Health on global warming. And I was like, oh my God, like amazing. Here's like a public, um, a public piece that's a comic that's like about the effects of global warming and like everyday life and urban life. Um, and just like how, yeah, seeing comics kind of like integrate themselves into these different disciplines and um, parts of life. Yeah, it makes me feel really excited about the medium um, and seeing how the medium is so effective on this like 
populist level. Um, so there is like that, that part is just inspiring and encouraging. Um, I think of like feeling really dedicated to it when it's uh, sometimes like a really challenging medium to just keep plowing away in. Um, but yeah, other parts of like the collaborating. Um, hmm. I don't remember what else, what else you were saying. Oh, I was just saying, um, I was just wondering if there were things that through collaborating, you know, you, you were talking about, not just in terms of the making of these things having to do with collaboration, but in terms of wanting to have conversations and, and wanting, to, wanting to communicate with people, not just yeah. beyond the piece being out in the world, but working with people in the field. Oh. I'm yeah. just wondering if there's things or conversations or things you've learned or-, or Yeah, oh, it's so about. cool. I mean, I've learned so much, like, I mean, from Hawaii, I was like, wow, I learned like half of, or, you know, like 20% of the like plants you'd find on the beach. Like I know their names now and I know like what insects are drawn to them and learning the difference between the Hylaeus and like these like five other tiny bees that look really similar. Um, that kind of stuff for me was just so cool. Like working with other people who are kind of experts in their own right and what their processes are and um, yeah, the things that they can teach me and yeah, and, and just comparing um, how, how we work. And you know, I think it's just like being around other, yeah, other people who are also in love with what they do. Um, that was something I was just talking about the other day with a friend because we were, uh, I was hanging out with a friend who's a field biologist who I volunteer for and yeah, just how it's this area of people who just love what they do and are passionate about what they do. And I think coming from art, it's like, that's, you know, I'm, I love what I do. So seeing these kind of intersections and, and seeing how people need each other in these ways, like, um, and especially with something like translating uh, that type of field work, it's like, I've seen those reports and I've read some of them, but they're like, absolutely like, kind of garble um, if you don't know all the specifics of the language. So um, even seeing that kind of space where it's like, oh, like the idea of, you know, maybe working with these people in the future um, <clears throat> through some kind of artistic means could actually be a way to really help what they're doing be digestible to a greater public or something. Um, so yeah, starting to see these different openings within those, those relationships with others. Thank you for that question, Jordan, that led to that. Um, I'm going to, uh, Jules, would you like um, me to read this or uh, Jules, would you like to uh, unmute and read this? I suppose it kind of partakes of the last question in a big way. Um, and also thank you so much for uh, the talk. It was um, very beautiful this far. Um, I was wondering when you started to um, sort of prioritize or integrate sort of pedagogy and teaching in your practice. Um, if anything incited or inspired that kind of turn in particular, sorry, it's like a multi-part question, all comes up. So uh, yeah, I suppose if anything incited or inspired it, what you what you feel you gain from uh, teaching people um, and also really particularly kind of whether you have any specific, um, you know, mandates or goals uh, in terms of uh, how or what you want to teach people and that, you know, in terms of your your general teaching practice or within the context of like specific workshops or specific classes that, uh, that you've given? Well, oh, thanks for the question, Jules. Um, I mean, I, I'll, I'll start by shouting out the Sequential Artist Workshop uh, saw <clears throat> in Gainesville, Florida as like Tom Hart, who, who started it, um, was the first person who invited me to come teach anything. And I'd done artist talks and I'd maybe done some like short two or three hour workshops, but Tom was like, come down and teach for a week. Um, and yeah, without kind of having an experience about what it meant to set up a real curriculum or anything. It was so fun and it was so exciting. And it was like such a beautiful, beautiful space to be in. Um, and, and having Tom also kind of like help direct me in terms of being like, hey, maybe they wanna know what they're gonna do today. <laughs> and being like, oh yeah, that's probably a good place to start. Um, yeah, I think that that was really inspiring. And I ended up, I, I did two week long workshops down at SAW um, 
and also did a, a kind of longer thing at the animation workshop in Viborg, Denmark. And so those were kind of the longer things I've done, but otherwise, um, yeah, that I've just kind of done these other shorter things and through IFER specifically have ended up trying to, um, yeah, trying to keep hosting events um, that are similar to that process because it was so invigorating and um, there's people from, oh my, well, Margaret, who I ended up collaborating with on Project Sue, she came to my class at SAW um, and she was like, well, this is really interesting. She was like, you want to come to Turkey for this project? Um, you know, and just like the relationships that came out of that were so meaningful. And be, I think because of, you know, the things I'm interested in, it's like finding these like minds through that process um, with, yeah, other artists. Um, and yeah, thinking of it as like a brainstorming space with folks. Uh, yeah, and, and something that just like helps me reflect on my own practice um, and see where, you know, there's probably, there's always gonna be limitations to what I, I can do and what I want to do. Um, but seeing where other people are like going off in all these other different directions and being really inspired by that. So I think coming back to that space over and over has just helped me stay stay engaged and interested and in, in seeing where other people have are entering these um, these pathways. So I mean that that's been really amazing. And uh, one of the workshops I'm teaching this coming week with IFER is uh, I'm collaborating with a, a field biologist who used to specialize in um, kangaroo rats. And so we're gonna do a, a collab course um, on like a night in the life of a kangaroo rat trying to use like some kind of first person animal perspective, um, and then also using Thea's specialty or um, kind of like Thea's research and knowledge to actually frame that in some of the kind of physiological constraints of the, of the kangaroo rats. Um, yeah, so it's like, you know, I don't have that specialty, so that'd be a hard class for me to teach, but seeing it as this opening to invite another person in who has incredible knowledge and experience. And then also, you know, I'm so curious who's going to be there and what what they'll also bring to it. Um, so yeah, I, these alternative spaces, especially, I think are really fun and playful. Thank you for that question, Jules. I think um, we have time for one more question. If anyone wants to ask one, this is your, this is your chance to come in and ask a question immediately if you, if you have one in mind. Um, if there isn't another question, um, we can we can really um, take this moment to thank Aiden for her time for a really, really incredible, um, uh, very informative talk and um, and for also taking so much time, you know, really the um, the other people we can thank we can we can thank Aiden also for um, taking time to answer your questions and we can also really thank the people who did ask questions because the, the idea of this symposium really is a conversation um, but, but between artists and, and um, um, the participants who, who view the talk. So I thank all of you for attending and for the, for the uh, questions that, that, really, um, that really furthered the conversation. Um, before I let you guys go, I am going to um, really encourage you to check out um, the talk that will happen um, next week at this same time, the way that you registered for this talk um is is the way that you can uh, register for this upcoming talk it's jason t miles september 6th um i just put a link in the chat with that and if you can just give me one moment another link i want to give you guys um is a link to our youtube channel um which has many many which has a, a rich archive of past seasons um of, of uh, the comic symposium. In a couple, maybe a week or so, um, Aiden's, Aiden's talk will be uh, on this page if you wanna refer back to it. But at the moment, there's, there's, um, so much, um, there's so much there already. And if you're interested in one of these upcoming, I'm also gonna put in a link to our um, fall 2022 season again. Um, if you're interested in any of these talks and you can't make them, um, Barring special circumstances, most of them will be um, um, on the YouTube uh, channel at, at some point. Um, so thank you all again. And thank you so much, Aiden, um, for this talk. And, yeah, thank you all so much.
Um, and also just to say like, you know, I do think of this as an ongoing conversation. So, you know, if anyone wants to talk more about, you know, what they're thinking of their practice. Um, yeah, my, I think my email is on my website and I'm always, always happy to chat. Thank you so much. Oh, actually, one thing I wanted to ask is, is there a way the, the recently published book um, that you talked about um, that isn't available in the US yet? Is there is there a link that you can give us if people are interested in in purchasing it? Um, well, funny you should ask because I was going to connect my friend who published it to you oh, well. about maybe some uh, distribution through Domino Books. So Perhaps well, don't we'll, we'll have that we'll have that conversation <laughs> aside from the symposium, but because um, then it's you know then then we're getting corrupt. But, <laughs> but thank you again so much, Aiden, and and thank you to um, thank you to everyone for for um, being here at this talk, and hopefully we'll see you guys next week, and have have a good rest of the night, Aiden. Thank you, thank you so much. Bye, you guys. Thank you. Bye.